When God created existence, the first beings he created were the angels, beings made entirely of light. They lived in the heavens and were entities in service to God. Next created were the jinn, creatures formed from smokeless fire. They were given dominion over the earth. The jinn were a people full of strife, and their unending wars jeopardized the globe. As punishment for their carelessness with his creation, God banished them to a neighboring plane of existence. From here, they were able to observe the earth, but only after much discipline could they interact with it. Then God created man, formed from clay. To welcome his newest creation, God ordered all in heaven to kneel before man. And they all did, save one. Iblis, king of the jinn, and the only jinn at the time to have been welcomed into heaven, refused to kneel. You formed the angels from pure light, and us from fire, and yet you ask us to kneel before one you made from mud. As many stories of the fall remind us, it wasn't the inaction that enraged God, but the defiance. Iblis was decreed to be exiled from heaven for all eternity. But Iblis was a charmer. He made a deal with God. He would serve his exile, not for eternity, but only until Judgment Day. At that time, Iblis's actions would determine whether or not he could return to heaven. But, also in that time, he would tempt man leading him astray, to prove to God that man was not worthy of the honor bestowed upon him. And so it was decided, man would inherit the earth, once ruled by the jinn, and Iblis would be his tormentor. I'm your host Jason, and you're listening to the Esoteric Book Club. Welcome back, goblins! Tonight we are reviewing The Vengeful Jinn, Unveiling the Hidden Agenda of Genies, by Philip J. Imbrogno and Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Released in 2011, this book proposed a way of explaining the phenomena that is now more accepted by researchers. In fact, the first chapter worried me a bit, because it was the explanation of string theory and the ideas behind the concepts of the fourth and fifth dimensions. Typically, when I see an explanation begin with this, my spidey sense for woo kicks into overdrive. The only New Age concept that triggers me more is the toxic positivity of the love and light community. Rest assured, this book is not woo. Some of the theories seem overly reductive. But we have to take into consideration that the phenomena of the jinn is framed by a specific cultural worldview. Much of what we know about the jinn comes from two sources. Religion, which includes the Quran and works by Islamic religious scholars, and from first-hand accounts. For those of us raised with a Christian-based zeitgeist, The Fall, with a capital F, is a foundational story that is not part of a religious text. Conversely, the introduction to today's episode comes directly from the Quran. Granted, my version combines several translations and various religious interpretations that have come about in the past 2,000 years. In fact, there is an entire book in the Quran dedicated to the jinn. But what are the jinn, and how do they relate to string theory? Bear with me. Physics is not one of my strengths. String theory proposes multiple dimensions in addition to our 3D world. The fourth dimension, as proposed by theoretical physicists, is time. We can't really see time, but we can see the effect that it has on the world around us. Perhaps you've heard of the term space-time? When astrophysicists talk about space-time, 
They are doing so in reference to a theoretical concept of traveling long distances in space without having to break the speed of light, which coincidentally would turn matter into pure energy if it came anywhere close to it. The warping of space-time is the weird effect we see in the area around a black hole. Things warp and bend, and time behaves differently. The warping of space-time is only one way that we can see the effects of the fourth dimension in our own dimension. Beyond the fourth dimension, science gets super speculative. While we can see how the fourth dimension affects us, the fifth dimension is far enough removed that we can't really see its effects. Stay with me just a little bit longer. I'm almost to the crux of this theory. We are 3D entities. We can see and interact with the second and first dimensions, but not with the fourth. At least, not naturally. Science is working on technology that would allow us to bend the laws of physics, but as an individual, you can't simply will time to stop. Something that existed in the fourth dimension could affect it in much the same way that you or I affect air or water. More so, an entity that lives within the fourth dimension would not necessarily view time as linearly as we do. The past and future would be as real to them as the present is to us. The reason the authors relay all of this information is because they propose that the jinn, entities described as being made of smokeless fire, could be extra-dimensional creatures. In this instance, creatures from the fourth dimension. They can see and interact with the third dimension, but we wouldn't necessarily be able to see them. Imbrogno proposes that the smokeless fire descriptor is figurative language describing what we know as plasma. This plasma isn't the jinn specifically, but it is the part of them that we can see manifested in the 3D realm. This plasma is also electromagnetic in nature, meaning that it interacts with electronics and is disrupted by iron, both of which are traits mentioned in jinn lore. Before I get too far into the weeds, let's backtrack and look at what the lore says about the jinn. The word jinn is an Arabic word for unseen or hidden, referring to the fact that oftentimes these entities are invisible. While we have accounts of humans speaking to and interacting with the jinn, we don't know what they call themselves or if they even have a term for their own species. In the Quran, they're called God's other children, since they were created alongside angels and eventually man. When they were first created, they were 3D entities. They had dominion over the earth and formed their own civilizations and kingdoms. Unfortunately, they were not a peaceful people. Their escalating wars devastated the world around them. Finally, God exiled them to a, quote, nearby plain and created mankind to replace the jinn. It is prophesied that should we ever devolve into war and chaos the way that the jinn did, we too would be replaced. It is believed that the jinn predated humanity by about 2,000 years. Their lifespan is extremely long, though, so the oldest jinn alive today could have seen the dawn of human civilization. In fact, the belief in jinn predates Islam. It's recorded that the Persians worshipped the jinni, a cognate for the word jinn and the origin for the modern word genie. They were known for being rewarding gods, but also unpredictable. They could be laughing and jovial one moment and fly into an unpredictable rage the next. There is speculation that Iblis, the king of the jinn, was also an angel in much the same way that Lucifer was before he was cast out of heaven. While they share a similar backstory, religious scholars believe that Iblis was not Lucifer, but the angel Azazel. Azazel is associated with the practice of sacrificing a scapegoat. In this practice, two goats were offered, 
One goat had the sins of the people doing the offering placed upon it and it was then sacrificed. The other goat was released into the wild as an offering to Azazel in exchange for sharing the knowledge of this rite. Furthermore, it is recorded that Azazel was so enamored with the earth that when he too refused to bow to man, he was thrust from heaven, but he was banished here for eternity. That means, when he taught the biblical Moses and Aaron how to perform the ritual of scapegoating, he was already in exile. This fits the model of the jinn, revealing hidden knowledge to humans in exchange for offerings. The trick is, you can never tell if what the jinn told you is true. That's because the jinn seem to lack empathy. They have no morals and no personal boundaries. All actions are allowed as a means to an end. It is said that one can't even trust a jinn that is converted to Islam. First, because you can't actually be sure that they converted, and second, because they will follow the letter of Islamic law, but not the intent. In Dungeons & Dragons terms, they are the perfect example of lawful evil. This also means that the jinn who have converted to Islam follow a very literal interpretation of the Quran. Beyond a general lack of trustworthiness, the jinn are also tricksters and shapeshifters. So, if you were wondering why Moses and Aaron couldn't simply recognize that Azazel was a jinn and not an angel, chances are it's because he took the form of an angel. More commonly, though, the jinn take the shapes of dogs, cats, and snakes. In dreams, because, yes, they can also invade your dreams, the most malevolent jinn will take the form of a camel. Gender roles are virtually non-existent with the jinn because they can shapeshift and do so frequently. It is said that they sometimes forget what their original gender was. This shows some parallels with the lore of the succubus and incubus, which is often a singular entity that takes on the role of either gender depending on the victim. While the jinn certainly have a lot of power and can bend reality to their will, they can't break the laws of physics. If they do, they evoke the wrath of God, who will immediately smite them. I mentioned earlier that some jinn convert to Islam. In fact, it is said that they are free to convert to and worship whomever they please. Some are even Christians, and some became Jewish. But why would an amoral entity find religion? The jinn seem to be the first creatures in creation to have one very specific trait. Free will. The goal behind their faith is the same as any who would follow Abrahamic religions. To get into heaven. There are also evil jinn who worship Iblis. Agnostic jinn who question the existence of Iblis and God. And even atheistic jinn. Unfortunately for us, the ones who seem to be the most willing to interact with humanity are those who worship Iblis. They are cruel, vicious, and will make any deal if it means that they can steal a human soul. Any bargain or wish made with these jinn are bound to end horribly, no matter how carefully they are phrased. Why would a jinn want a human soul, though? Before we can answer that, we have to look at how the jinn society is structured. First is the individual. Jinn are described based on the level of their ability, age, and disposition. Typically, their abilities increase with age, but that's not a hard and fast rule. They can be ancient, but still not magically talented. This could be from a lack of natural ability or from lack of practice. The hen, with an H, are young, trickster jinn who behave more like an unruly pet than anything else. Their shape-shifting abilities are typically limited to a single form, often that of a dog. The marid are one of the most rare types. They are ancient, extremely powerful, and exceptionally malevolent. These jinn, whether through magic or through sheer force of will, have remained on our plane. They inhabit out-of-the-way locations such as caves, swamps, and deserts. While all jinn can be considered amoral, the marid are truly evil. 
They have little care for mankind and will react hostily, especially if they are placed in a position where they have to choose between jinn and man. On the plus side, they are the most emotionally stable, thus less likely to fly into a rage. They view humans with cold, calculating indifference. The Nosnos are twisted animal-human hybrids. We're not talking centaurs or werewolves either. Think more like a Hieronymus Bosch creation. Skeletally thin, chicken feet, bat wings, goat eyes, and a snake's tongue. Really weird combinations. They are responsible for strife, disease, and possessions. They are quick to make a bargain, but the price almost always outweighs the benefit that it would bestow. The Sheik are lower-level entities that can't quite fully manifest. Think of Genie from the animated Aladdin movie. Most of the time, instead of legs, he just had a plume of smoke. They are generally young, with limited magical ability. They may be able to shapeshift to a limited degree, and possibly to fly. Finally, we have the Shaitan. Technically, there are two divisions to talk about here. When Iblis was exiled, he was given the epithet, the Deceiver, or Shaitan with a capital S. The jinn who worship him are also referred to Shaitan collectively. These are the jinn equivalent of terrorists. They actively plot the destruction and downfall of mankind. Their goal is singular to retake the earth for themselves. Now that we understand the individual jinn, we will look at the family unit. These are often limited to a pair and their offspring, if they have any. For some reason, jinn are only able to reproduce once in their lifetime, which means their numbers are continuously dwindling. This is in contrast to their unnaturally long lives. Because of this, Jin parents are fiercely protective of their children. If you thought it was dangerous to come between a mother bear and her cubs, imagine if all that fury was also enhanced with magical abilities. Jin mothers will hunt a person to the ends of the earth in order to exact revenge on anyone who harms their child. Jin are also organized into larger familial units called clans. This includes distant relatives and families that have been adopted into the larger group. Angering a clan is the equivalent of kicking a magical beehive. The clan is also responsible for governing the actions of their own people. There may not be laws among the jinn, but when justice is served, is generally done at the clan level. Each clan is usually governed by the oldest member or by a small council of eldest. Finally, large groups of clans are organized and controlled by a king. This king is ancient and unfathomably powerful. He is so powerful that he can only be overthrown through assassination. It is unclear whether there is a singular king of all jinn, or if there are multiple kingdoms, each with their own ruler. Either way, once a century, all lesser jinn are required to pay tribute to their king. The most welcome tribute is a human soul. No one knows why they desire human souls or what they use them for. Granted, we don't know why demons want souls either. What the author of this book proposes is that these entities feed on energy, specifically energy generated by fear. More than that, they propose that some modern paranormal sightings are really the jinn in disguise. It's hard to ignore the similarities between the jinn and fairy encounters. Then again, there are many similarities between fairies and alien sightings, too. Ultimately, I feel like this brings into question the nature of all this phenomena. Are they one and the same? Are they all multidimensional? Is it coincidence that they are all so very similar? While I have no definitive answers from this book, I will be looking into this concept in a future episode, 
so consider this a bit of a teaser. For now, we've reached the end of this episode. This book is a well-researched and well-written look at the phenomena that is largely unexplored in the Western world. Then again, it's hard to expect less from Rosemary Ellen Guiley. If any of this intrigued you, and trust me, there is much, much more in this book, check out The Vengeful Jinn, Unveiling the Hidden Agendas of Genies, by Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Philip J. Ambrogna. Links will be in the show notes. The next episode will be the final episode of Season 1. This show has come quite a long way from where it first began. The length increased, the quality improved, and hopefully I've become less awkward. As a thank you to patrons, I'll be sending out a care package at the end of March. Which means you still have time to join and get in on the goodies. It's not much, but I wanted to thank everyone who was helping me to make this show a reality. I have to also give a shout out to my top tier patron, Samantha Shaver, who suggested I should review this book. Do you want to have a say in future content? You can if you join my Patreon. There are multiple tiers, each with different benefits, including being mentioned by name in future episodes. Esoteric Book Club can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and at esotericbookclub.org. If you enjoy the show, please like, share, and leave a review. Intro and outro music is courtesy of Sarah Rudy and her band Hello June. Their music can be found at bandcamp.com and at wearehellojune.com. Until next time, remember, stay weird. Alright, you extra special weirdos. Time for your bonus content. Tonight, it's in the form of a first-hand account with a gin.